As Pak Budi said, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about public-private partnerships and uh, whether it fits Indonesia. Now, why am I talking about public-private partnerships? First of all, Pak Budi asked me to talk about something different. He said, I always hear you talking about CBGs, and I'd like you to talk about something a little bit different today. So I'm thinking, what can I talk about? And uh, then uh, a group from uh, the health team from TNP2K went to see Ibu Nila one day, and they had a long discussion about public-private partnerships. And apparently, this is a very important topic for the minister. And so um, I also remember Ibu Nina from Bapanas during the health sector review saying that public-private partnerships was something they wanted to emphasize much more in the next five years. So it gave me uh, some pause to say, let's talk about the global experience and let's try to think about whether there are some lessons, some options for Indonesia. Next slide. So I will mostly talk about Europe, although I'll also touch a little bit on Canada and also touch a little bit on Brazil. But if you look at the European experience, uh, it's, the public and private are certainly, uh, a, a, they're certainly a part of every system. Uh, the systems that we usually think about and talk about and learn from in Europe. Uh, and you can see they're integrated uh, all across the board. Hospitals, pr uh, primary health care, uh, dental, drugs, ambulance services. So you see that just looking at the European situation, public and private, are a part of every health system in a very important way. Next slide. So if we think about public-private partnerships, April Harding, a colleague of mine from the World Bank, would say, think about it in relatively simple terms. Think first about the contracting experience uh, from a government or public agency. In, a, in the case of Indonesia, it could be BPJS uh, to deliver health services. But then also think about something else, which is what she calls co-investment or asset use transaction. So that gets a little bit more complicated and that gets beyond the contracting situation. Next slide. <clears throat> when BPJS started, President of Indonesia said, I want both public and private hospitals and primary care services in uh, BPJS. And so when they started, on January 1st, 2014, they had a contract with 919 private hospitals. So immediately, the president wanted an integrated public-private system under BPJS. Today, that number is a little bit less, but it's still relatively high, 690 as of last month. Next slide. Why do we want to think about public-private partnerships? Uh, and what I've heard in Indonesia so far is that it could mobilize private finance. It could bring more money into the system, and that's a very important objective. Uh, what I hear less in Indonesia is other, other, other objectives, other objectives for public-private partnerships. Some of the objectives that we see in other countries might be improving access, uh, introducing efficiencies, improving quality, and also equity equity, because a big part of public-private partnerships, the discussion in any country is, who is it going to help? Who is it going to help? Is it going to help the rich or the poor, or is it going to help everyone? And I don't hear, at least in my conversations, I don't always hear these secondary objectives that I've, that I've, that I've listed here. Next slide. So contracting, um, let's, let's go through a couple of examples in Europe. Uh, I list them here. They, you can buy services, you can buy packages, you can um, <clears throat> think about financing um, uh, facilities, and you can think about combining both facility and service operation. And we'll go through each of these, these countries and these, uh, and, these, um, uh, and these examples. Next slide. So, so in Estonia, it was a former Soviet country. Everything was public. And what they did in Estonia was establish first the, the for, for primary health care, the primary health care package. Uh, the new BPJS in Estonia uh, encouraged uh, primary, uh, private primary health care practices, uh, and they would contract them with the design package, okay? And very importantly, um, 
the, the payment was capitation payment, but also the patient would choose. The patient would choose what primary care organization they wanted to, to, to register with. So that was a very important part of the, of the contracting process was this demand side element. Um, and they saw quite an impact in terms of responsiveness, in terms of quality, uh, and also efficiency, and they even had an independent evaluation. So that's the Estonian experience. Next slide. Also in the UK, I'm sure John knows much more about this than I do, but uh, in the UK, they, uh, in the early part of this century, uh, the National Health Service uh, uh, contracted for specified outpatient services. And they gave quite a long contract, a contract of five years. Uh, and they um, worked with operators where they paid them on the basis of a fixed volume contract. Yesterday, Victoria talked about the German model where they had both price and volume in their contract. And they did the same thing in the UK. Uh, and then the operator was responsible for some capital and provided the services at the facility under this volume and price contract. Okay, and you can see uh, that uh, it had some uh, positive impacts uh, in terms of the NHS allowing them to mobilize capital, to expand their services, they reduced some of their waiting lists in the UK, um, they uh, found that they'd improved the efficiency and also improved some uh, quality based on some indicators. Thanks. Romania, in Romania, the BPJS uh, developed contracts with dialysis centers. Dialysis centers and here, what's very important about the Romania experience is that there were negotiations and contracts based on prices, but also uh, in the contract there was a mobilization of capital, but also a real effort to improve quality, to improve quality through new national standards. Uh, and um, uh, so they saw some savings in terms of uh, in terms of cost savings, but they also saw real improvements in terms of quality. Uh, because they focus both on the cost side and on the quality side. Next slide. Please. So that's contracting. Let's go into a little bit more, um, let's go a little bit deeper in terms of uh, a co-investment or asset use in public-private partnerships here. Next slide. Here we can talk about the, the uh, example of Spain. In Spain, the, the, they had a public system. So the problems, uh, and I'll let you read some of this on the slide, but the problems uh, that they faced uh, had to do with the budget deficit, lack of budget, number one. Secondly, there was a perception that the quality was not adequate. It was lower in terms of what uh, patients expected. And third, there was a perception of inefficiency inefficiency, okay? And so what they did was, in this area of Spain, Valencia, in five of the 21 districts, they um, contracted out all of the services in the district to a private operator. So these were public facilities. These were public facilities that were then outsourced to private consortia. Okay, that was the entire health system. So if you're living in a district, if you're living in a district, your health facilities, your health system is managed by a private operator. Um, and they were paid on a capitation basis. They were paid on a capitation basis. Next slide. Third party operator, they went to uh, firms that had been experienced and had some track record, okay? They had capabilities in financing and managing large-scale projects. Uh, secondly, they were given some autonomy to manage the network of providers uh, and also system governance. Um, and uh, they also had very strong incentives. They had very strong incentives, both from the standpoint of their payment, but also from the standpoint that people, if they were not happy with the services, they could go to other 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 districts for their health care. Next slide. 
Let's go to Brazil. In Brazil, they built a number of hospitals through the um, through the government budget process, but then they did something similar, which was they um, they then went to a not for not for profit hospital operator to operate the hospital under some services coverage contract, and that included both clinical and non clinical. Uh, services. Next slide. See a global fixed budget, both for capital and for variable cost. Uh, they also, in the contract, specified patient volume targets and quality parameters. Uh, and I list one here. Uh, now, why was volume important there? Volume was important there to actually encourage more work, because one of the problems in Brazil was that they were actually not working that hard. So the volume, yesterday Victoria talked about the volume as a way to keep the utilization down. Here, the volume contract was really to encourage uh, a greater productivity and also uh, the quality parameters were built in as a way to measure the performance. Uh, another very important part of this of this uh, pilot was that they had standardized financial management systems. Standardized financial management systems so that they could actually look to see who was doing the best job in terms of efficiency relative to outcomes. So they covered the, um, they both covered the quality side and the efficiency side. Next slide. So the, um, here are some of the results. You can see the blue is, is after the red before. You can see the productivity went up. You can see that the uh, average length of stay went down. Uh, there's a number of other, other indicators in terms of quality, which I, I don't show here, but uh, this gives you just a, a glimpse of the, of the improved productivity that they saw in Sao Paulo. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about the hospital markets in Europe. Um, going back to Europe, um, we see two types of hospital markets, two types of hospital mar markets either segmented or integrated. So you could go to a country such as the UK or some of the Nordic countries or some of the former Soviet Union countries where public and private are relatively independent of each other. Um, or you could go to a place like Germany where you could find the public and private are relatively integrated. Now, for me, it's kind of interesting because in Indonesia, we have both. We have a somewhat integrated system, 600 or so hospitals contracted to BPJS, but at the same time, we still have some hospitals outside of the system, and so it's a relatively segmented market in that sense. Next slide. So here's the UK, and in market, you can see mostly public hospitals, but some private hospitals. Next slide. In this, in this case, uh, what does the government uh, do for the, um, for the public hospitals? They're involved in governance. They're involved in funding arrangements. For the private side, they're only involved in regulation. Um, and I don't know to what extent in, in Indonesia we fully regulate private hospitals outside of the system yet, but nevertheless, we might think about what the UK does in terms of regulation of the private sector if they are outside of the NHS. Next slide. Um, now, even in the public sector in the UK, uh, a few years ago, they embarked on uh, a pilot program called the Private Financing Arrangements, or Private Financing PFI, private financing, what was the PFI, private financing initiative, PFI, private financing initiative. So even within this public sector, they started this private financing initiative, a public-private partnership. I believe it was under the Blair government. Why did they do this? They didn't have budget. So they didn't have fiscal space. They said, how can we continue to build new hospitals if we don't have the budgetary space to invest. 
So what they did was <clears throat> encourage private investment of hospitals. In return, the NHS would give them a 30-year contract. A 30-year contract and pay them as an NHS hospital for 30 years. Okay, so that was basically the PFI. Next slide. So the good part was that it did generate private capital. And another good part was that many hospitals were built according to NHS standards. But what was the problem? There are many problems. There are many problems in the, in the PFI initiative. One was that you had to more or less predict population, disease profile, demographics, um, for 30 years. In Indonesia, that, in my way of thinking, that would be very hard to do. Very hard to do. Indonesia is rapidly growing, rapidly changing, disease profile is changing, and um, there's a lot of migration. Maybe in a mature economy like the UK, it's possible, but even since that has started, they found that it has not worked very well. The second problem they had is that uh, maintenance of these facilities has not uh, been um, uh, the, best, the best quality. Uh, and many people have told me their own experience in the UK that, uh, that they feel that the, the contract has not worked well uh, over time. Next slide. Now, if you have an integrated system, the government obviously does more than governance. It also does funding, regulation, information flows. And that's what the government would be expected to do here. The BPJS would be expected to do here uh, through its integrated system of contracts with 600 or so hospitals. Next slide. And that is Germany. Again, Victoria talked about it yesterday, but they have public, they have private, they have uh, non-profit. Next slide. One of the things an integrated system can do is allow purchasers like BPJS to collect information on public and private hospitals. On public and private hospitals. And to use that information to look at not only efficiency, but look at outcomes and quality. So if you go to Ontario, and you go to the website, in fact, you don't have to be in Ontario, you can just go to the Ontario website, and you can see that for different things, like here it's listed abdominal aortic artery repair. So they have the mortality rate. They have the mortality rate year by year. Uh, the blue says your hospital is better than average. The white says you're average. The red says you're not doing so well. You're below average. So if you're going to this hospital for this particular procedure, you can see online how you're doing uh, or what, what, how well the quality will be relative to other hospitals. So in a few years, I would expect to see the same thing in Indonesia with the information that BPJS is now collecting. Next slide. Messages. <coughs> I think that we, when we think about public-private partnerships, we have to think about a couple of things. And again, this is from April Harding's so-called five-factor framework. So first of all, service contractability. How easy is it? How easy is it? Uh, how well-defined are the services? How well-defined are the services? Uh, what's included? Um, how easily pri how priced can it be? Uh, how easily regulated can it be? Secondly, what's the investment size and what's the potential exposure for the public sector? Because anything we push out to the private sector, the public sector will still have to be ultimately responsible for it. So if we ask them to invest in something, what is the exposure? And if they fail, if they fail, will the government be ready to come in to fix the problem. Next slide. And I think if you look at different types of services, from non-clinical to primary health care to hospital coverage, 
to combine, you see that uh, it becomes relatively risky as we move from the simple to the more complicated, the more bundled services packages. Uh, it becomes relatively more risky and, and diff more difficult to purchase. Next slide. Factor, what are the goals of PPP? Again, can we move beyond can we move beyond more money into the system, getting more money into the system, and think about what are our sectoral objectives? I think this would be a good place to start for Indonesia uh, and to think about um, <clears throat> if we develop more PPPs, uh, who's going to benefit? What income groups are going to benefit? What geographic areas are going to benefit? What parts of the health sector are going to benefit? So. Some of the things that we see in other countries is that when they develop a public-private partnership, there is some explicit, some explicit part of that partnership which includes the poor. So you may, for example, if you contract with a private hospital, you may say some percentage of your patients have to be the poor, PBI. So that's one way to do it. Uh, next slide. No, nope, go back one. Fourth, uh, again, implications for non-performance. If there's failure by the private sector, what happens? Uh, who's going to pick up the pieces? And then fifth, we always need to evaluate. If we do start down this road of public-private partnerships, let's build in some evaluation mechanism. Next slide. Basically, this just looks at the global evidence in terms of cost savings, in terms of quality improvement, in terms of capital mobilization, uh, in terms of improved management, but also performance risk, performance risk. So what we see here is that as it becomes more complicated, as the service package becomes bigger, the potential payoffs are higher. At the same time, the potential for performance risk, failure, also increases. So we get into riskier areas, we may, be, we may see bigger benefits, but at the same time, the public sector, the government, has to be ready for, um, for, for, for anticipating uh, things not working and being ready to rush in and to provide a support uh, if, the, if the private sector fails.